Today I'll be walking through a tutorial on how to build a permission system for your RAG-enabled LLM. So just a quick disclaimer, this will be a longer form video where I'm going to be walking through step by step exactly how the system is implemented. I'm also going to show a lot more code examples. Just to give you some context, um, a RAG-enabled LLM is an LLM that should be able to use external documents as context um, for more custom responses. So imagine that I have a Google Drive and it has uh, files that don't have, that aren't publicly available on the internet. So one example is in this file, I'm defining a term called Patayu. It's, it's not a real word, right? You can't find it on Google. You can't find the dictionary. It's not an acronym for anything, but I defined it in this file as a way to test RAG permissions. And if done successfully, a chatbot won't be able to define it unless you're authenticated and have permissions to this file. So that basically gets us into what a permission system essentially is in a RAG enabled LLM if an unauthenticated user or a user that's authenticated without permissions tries to ask a question, we won't use context from those files that they don't have permission to. We'll only use files that they do have permission to. And um, in contrast, if you do have permissions, we should be able to get those files and get that context, and the chatbot should respond with that context. So I'll just demo demonstrate it right now. This is an unauthenticated user. They have not logged into our application, and we can ask, what is Pataiu? And it should give a pretty generic answer. It's not widely recognized. It could be an acronym, a typo, and it doesn't really know, right? We flip to our authenticated user. This user has enabled integrations with Google Drive and Dropbox, and they do have permissions to that FAQ file. They might ask, what is Patayu? And you can see that it's using context from that FAQ file. It says um, it's a term used for testing RAG permissions. It doesn't have a meaning beyond the context of this demo. And we can even source it and say it's from that Google Drive Paragon FAQ file. So that's great. That's the first part of first part of this application's capabilities. We know that permissions are also constantly changing, right? People can get added as contributors or get their access revoked. And we want our chatbot to be able to respond to those permissions in real time. So imagine that I want to revoke access and take that authenticated user um, from an editor to someone who doesn't have access to the file anymore. So I revoked their access. Now, if we go back to the chatbot, and now we regenerate that question, we can see that those permissions are updated, right? This user, um, it says, Batayu doesn't appear to be widely recognized, and it gives a very similar answer to the answer of the unauthenticated user, and it no longer sources that file. So now we know everything's working. Our chatbot is able to respect permissions and also respond to updates and permissions. But let's walk through step-by-step step how our system is actually working. So first, I will walk through this architecture diagram and walk through the flow of how permissions are being checked. So the first thing is the user authenticates and logs into our application, and they ask us a prompt. Parado, the name of our chatbot, Parado will go to an internal graph database called fine grain authorization, and we're using Okta's implementation of this FGA, and we'll ask it what documents is this user permitted to. We'll get back those document IDs, and then we'll actually check with the third party, so check with Google Drive's API or check with Dropbox API, and ask it, do we actually have permissions to the document IDs that we got back from our graph database? And it'll return, like true or false, if we have permission or not. Only then do we go to our Pinecone vector database, and if you're not aware, vector databases are generally how RAG-enabled applications store external data. And if you want more details, again, we can link the first tutorial that we post about Parado with some of those details in the description. We will ask the Pinecone database using metadata filters to grab only vectors that are associated with those document IDs. And then Pinecone will return to us those vectors that are filtered down. And only then do we use those vectors to return a response back to the user. So that was a lot to go over. I want to explain the exact design decisions behind some of these choices. The reason we are doing this third-party check is because the requirements for Parado is that we want to uphold permissions above all else. We would rather have our application be a little bit slower and have a little bit more complexity than return permissions that, return documents that they're not permitted to. So with every query, right, we're going to the third-party API and confirming that we do indeed have permissions. The reason we're using a self-managed graph database is because we don't want to ask our third-party API, like we don't want to ask Google Drive API for permission from every single document that we have available. We first want to go through a pre-filter using our graph database and say, what ID document IDs do we think this user has permissions to? 
and then only use that subset of document IDs to pass into our third-party API. Ideally, this graph database is a source of truth, right? This reflects the permissions from Dropbox and from Google Drive, but we do know that errors and bugs and faults do happen, and so we do want to do a verified check with our third-party integration, and that's why we have a two-pronged approach here. This vector database query is pretty standard, and so I think we're ready to jump into the, the actual implementation and code behind the individual steps. For steps one and two, I'll skip over. You just log in, and then you ask our chatbot a question. We'll start with step three. Now that we've gotten a question asked and the user is authenticated, let's get the document IDs that user is permitted to. So I'm going to jump into our, the back end of our RAG application. This code is a lot of its starter code from Create Llama. And if you would like to see how exactly the starter code works and the steps to build it, again, you can see our first tutorial video. But I'll start with once we get the users authenticated, we need to get the document IDs from FGA, from our graph database. So what we're using is we're using um, an FGA client. And this client, essentially, we want to query for each role that a user might have. They might be a reader, a writer, or an owner of a file, of a document. Um, get us all the documents that this user is the owner of, the writer of, and the reader of, and then return those document IDs to our application. And so I'll quickly jump. So we're using FGA. And FGA, this is what their database looks like. It's a graph database that has um, relationship tuples that keep track of those the owner, reader, writer relationships. For example, this user ha is an owner of this document. This document, this folder might be the parent of this document. And so you can model a bunch of different types of relationships. One thing that's really important to know is that we have ability to control the schema and the relationships and object types that our graph database has. In this case, we have a schema that's really well suited for file storage systems like Dropbox and like Google Drive. So we have users. We can keep track of what integration that each document's a part of, whether it's Google Drive or Dropbox. They might have some sort of like group or Teams functionality. They most likely will have folders. And lastly, they have documents. And for each of these object types, we can define the relationships, right? We can define if they're an owner, a parent, a reader, or a writer. And this is a very flexible approach that should be able to handle a bunch of different types of integrations. So that goes through steps three and four. Now let's go into, now that we got back the document IDs from our graph database, let's actually go to our third party API and go through steps five through eight. So starting with step five, we got back our document IDs from our graph database. Now we want to check the third party for permissions as a last minute check to be absolutely sure that these IDs are verified. So for each of our integrations, Google Drive and Dropbox in this tutorial, we will actually go to their API. So we'll go to Google Drive's API and Box's API, and we'll check in this function, we'll check if those files are actually permitted to that user. And so what we're expecting is that there should be a permitted field that's a Boolean that we have in our TypeScript function. And if it is permitted, if we are permitted and it's true, then we can add it to our verified document IDs. So now you might be wondering, are, are we hitting the actual Google Drive API and Dropbox API directly? And the answer is yes and no. And that's where Paragon kicks in. It's, it's a middleman to help us interact with third-party APIs where we don't have to worry about authentication. It gives us monitoring. It gives us rate limits. It gives us like horizontal scaling. And I will actually show the exact workflow that is being used for the checks. I will look at this workflow, right? In this workflow, we are, this API is getting triggered by our backend application, that verification URL. For each document ID, we are actually getting the permission from Google Drive's API. And so we can see the API tells us what role that every user and the role that has access to that file. And then what we end up returning to our application is like what I was saying, right? It has the file ID, the document ID, and then a Boolean if it's permitted, true or false. And that's what we're interacting with here. That's the expected result we're waiting to get back. Now we're getting back these verified IDs. So we're at step nine. Um, we'll jump back into our application and see that we have now a list of verified IDs. We will now be going into our chat engine. And using these document IDs, using these document IDs, we're generating metadata filters. And these metadata filters are used to actually retrieve only the vectors that um, only the vectors that have those associated document IDs in our Pinecone database. So that's what's happening here. 
And we can see if we go to our Pinecone database console, this is essentially what's exactly what's happening, right? We're grabbing file ID of specific document and only returning those vectors. So all three of these vectors have that file ID, you can see, 15H, file ID 15HDC, right? And these file IDs actually match with our internal source of truth, our graph database. So if we search up 15H, we see we, we actually have those permissions. We see that this user is the owner of this document. We see this folder is the parent of this document. And so the metadata filtering, the metadata in Pinecone matches up with our graph database, which is the exact IDs that should match up in our third-party APIs as well. This document ID is actually the document ID from Google Drive. That's how we are identifying each document uniquely in all of our databases. Now we've retrieved the databases. Now we can finally return those, reuse those vectors as context and actually return a response to the user. So we showed the third-party checks that are being enabled. You might be wondering, actually, how did I do that real time when I removed permissions? How did I update the permissions? I haven't really showed that yet. And actually, that brings us to a bunch of background processes that it's done by the application that's not done at query time. This diagram essentially shows how permissions data is being piped into our FGA graph database, how we're responding to updates. I'll just focus on the updates piece for this tutorial, but the permission ingestion piece is very similar to how data ingestion is done. And we explained that in our first tutorial video to plug that video again. In orange is how we're actually updating permissions in real time. So the third party API will send us a webhook message and we're using Paragon's webhook engine to spin up webhook consumers that will listen to any permission changes, send those changes directly to our chatbot, and that chatbot will update the permissions in our graph database. So let's walk through the Paragon workflow. I will go to, uh, I'll go into our task history since we actually just updated those permissions. So first we get those file changes, those permission changes. We get it from Google's API. Then for each permission, we are doing a little bit of parsing where we're parsing, we have some logic that formats our data in a way that our backend is expecting. So I'll actually show that logic real quick. Parse file permissions. We have custom JavaScript code that's, like I said, formatting our exact JSON object that we're expecting in our application. And now let me go back to task history. Um, we can actually see that it's going to send this data to our backend, and we're going to hop back into our backend again and see that when permission changes occur, we handle them by updating these permissions, right? And so for each permission type, owner, reader, and writer, we are comparing those new permissions that Paragon sent us from Google Drive with the permissions that we currently have in FGA. We're seeing the current types of users, and again, we're using our graph database and consulting with that and seeing what users are currently permitted. We are comparing that with the updated data that we just got, and then we're looking for the differences. For all the users in the updated permissions, grant those users permission, and for all the users that are currently in the graph database but are not in the updated permissions, revoke permissions for them. And we can actually see that in our logs, and I did these logs just for demonstration purposes, but you can see that the current owners of this file is just this user, and the updated is still that user, so nothing is done there, right? But for writers, when we revoke permissions, this user is currently in our graph database. We say that he is a writer, um, but in the updated mm -hmm. permissions that we got, we can see it's empty. There are not supposed to be any writers, and therefore this user has their access revoked, so we delete that relationship tuple in our graph database. So our graph database should always be a source of truth, but again, we're using that third-party check to be absolutely certain. Um, lastly, I I'll go through exactly, just real quick, some additional logs that we have. When I mentioned that we are getting the document IDs from our graph database, this is what it looks like, right? It it's just an array of document IDs here. When we go through our third-party check, we are getting back that that exact object that I showed in the Paragon workflow, the file ID with a Boolean, if it's permitted, true or false. And then lastly, we can see that these are the documents that they're using as context in the response because they have access to both of those document IDs. So that is the entire workflow, both at query time and these background processes that are happening. Hopefully you can see that there is a pretty comprehensive process for checking permissions.
I do want to say that this is not the only way to do it. We actually made a lot of design decisions and picked these technologies based off what we were seeing. But of course, depending on your use case, there are a bunch of different ways to do it. And if this helped you or you're interested in Paragon or have questions about permissions for your RAG system, please feel free to reach out to us and we would love to talk to you. Thanks.